Um, let's, let's continue with that same anticipation that the Holy Spirit is going to meet us tonight. And, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to start with a, with a little story of, of me. I'm, I'm a little Christian nerd. By the way, you guys can sit down. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little nerd. I grew up a Christian nerd. Uh, one of the reasons why I grew up as a Christian nerd was because I grew up without a TV. And my parents just didn't want a TV. And another reason why I, I was a Christian nerd is I was not allowed to play with action figures. Um, you know, it, 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 it just had a lot to do with my parents' convictions. So I sometimes had a tough time on playgrounds when it came to role play. You know, guys running around, play fighting, beating each other up. And you know, before long, everybody starts taking on an identity of a superhero. So when you take on the identity of a superhero, you obviously know about superheroes, but I didn't have a TV. So I only knew about superheroes from hearsay when the kids were talking about it in school. And I grew up in Germany. Germany is very post-Christian. Less than 1% of the people in the country identify as born-again Christians. So I was pretty lonely with my upbringing as a Christian. So when it came to playground, you know, playground times, uh, everybody would just, you know, just, just fight for their favorite superhero. I do remember that at that particular time, uh, He-Man was a big man. <laughs> So it was a He-Man and Skeletor and, you know, you start building different parties. But I didn't really know how to cope with it. So I just had to stick to what I knew. And so when they asked me about who I was, I said I was Elijah. <laughs> and I kid you not, they probably reacted the exact same way how you just reacted. And if you have no idea who I'm referring to, I'm referring to a Bible character. Because that's what I knew. That's what I grew up with. Listening to tapes, just narrating stories from Scripture. And, yeah, Elijah was my favorite guy, my go-to guy. I identified with him, the one that I loved, the one that I wanted to be like. And then they were like, oh, what were his superhero powers? And, and I'm like, yeah, he would call down fire from heaven. I don't remember how the role play went. I don't know. I think I won. <laughs> but I do want to take you to a story from my favorite Bible superhero that I've identified with the most growing up, which is Elijah. And interestingly, I've known for a little while that I was going to speak this, this evening. And twice prior to me, other people were up here and they started referencing Elijah. I was like, oh, no. I want to speak about that. That's my guy. But nobody stole the passage, that section of what I wanted to speak about. So I actually think it's quite exciting. As a matter of fact, there was one Wednesday night. I was sitting in the front row and I was texting Juan like crazy. And I was like, oh, no, oh, no, he's getting closer to my verse. He's getting closer to my verse. But uh, we diverted a uh, catastrophe. And the verse that I want to speak to you guys about from the Elijah, so the famous Elijah story was not hit. So I'm going to take you guys there and I'm going to give you guys real, real quick, fast context. Um, by the way, if you do take notes, write down this as your, as your title, Proximity to the Altar Matters. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, I'm talking about the famous, most known Elijah story, which is a contest, which is a showdown between Baal's priests who were made up idols Baal's priests and the prophet Elijah at a time when there was an evil king at reign, corrupt leadership, and God had been totally abandoned, abandoned within Israel. And Elijah literally thought, it's me all by myself upholding the virtue and the truth of who God is. And so Elijah actually approaches the king and he says, hey, we're going to have a challenge. You're going to take your Baal's priests. I'm going to come. And we're going to put a sacrifice on an altar. And we're going to call all the people of Israel. And we're going to have them watch what happens. 
And so I'm going to read one verse from 1 Kings 18.21. It says, then Elijah stood in front of them. And now you have to picture that. In front of them, they're at a mountain. Baal's priests are there. Elijah is there. And then all of Israel is gathered. So it must have been a sea of people. And it says, then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. There was a silence because people had abandoned God. And so Elijah, as he stands on that mountain, he is establishing the rules for this contest. And the rule for the showdown was each one of them had to prepare a sacrifice with the catch that neither the Baal's priests nor Elijah were allowed to set fire to the sacrifice. And both of the two parties had to reach out to their God. This is actually what it said in verse 24. This is what Elijah said. He said, then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. Something that stuck with me was a story for a really long time growing up. I always thought the story is about Elijah against the Baal's priest. But I've noticed that every time Elijah addressed someone while on that mountain, he actually was addressing the people. I think as much as it was for the Baal's priest and for God to be proven as a true and real God, it also even the more was for the people that were watching. And you guys probably know the ending of the story. The Baal's priest, they do their thing. Nothing happens. Elijah gets real confident, makes fun of him. Nothing happens. It's Elijah's turn. Elijah prepares the sacrifice. He prays. Fire falls from heaven. God's proven to be the true God. But I want to go and, and, and get stuck on a scripture that is right in the middle of this entire story. Now we're going to picture this. Baal's priests over here. All right. They're in this corner. Elijah over here. And nothing has happened at this moment. The only thing that has happened is that the Baal's, street, uh, Baal's priests tried what they could do. But Elijah was just ready to step up to the plate. And this is what the scripture says. And that's 1 Kings 18.30. I would recommend for you to circle that if you have a Bible that you can take notes in or mark things. And it says, then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. You guys get the image, right? Yeah? All right, I'm actually going to have some, some help here. We're going to bring some bricks up here on the stage real quick. They're, they're real heavy bricks, as you can see. Jordan must be really strong because he's carrying, like, what I could only carry one of, and he's carrying four of them at the same time. But literally, you have to imagine that the problem that we have here is a bunch of rocks laying around because this one verse says something. It says, the altar of the Lord had been torn down. What is the first thing of action that Elijah does when it is his turn? He calls out to the people and he says, come over here. I don't know if any of you guys ever heard this phrase in your home. But if you've heard this phrase in your home, I live with two ladies, my daughters, and my first lady, my wife. So when I hear come over here and it comes from the youngest, usually something is broke and I need to come and fix it. The second girl, the oldest one, if she says come over here, she is probably screaming because she found a bug in her room. <laughs> and if it's my wife who's calling, I probably created a mess that I needed to come and clean up. But the word come over here indicates that wherever I am is too far away from where I should be to understand the issue that is going on. You don't say come over here and then you stay there and then my kids are trying to figure out the, the, the situation by themselves. And I believe that's the exact same situation that prophet Elijah was stuck in. Because they invited all the Israelites to the showdown. But obviously, based on the scripture, because they were far away, there was some distance. But he is calling them 
to come over to come closer. And interestingly, we all know this story, right? So, so Elijah already knows everything that's happening. But we read about bricks, stones that were scattered all over because the altar of the Lord has been torn. I want to illustrate something to you. Jacob and, and Christian, can I invite you guys to just kind, kind of come up here and stand by the stage? And can you try to somehow rearrange those bricks that it looks like an altar? Okay? If I go all the way over here, all right, if I go all the way over here and I watch what these guys are doing, I may have an idea of what actually is happening. But there is a difference. I think these guys need a hand here. But there is a difference that when you stand up close and you see exactly what's happening. Interestingly, in that scripture, Elijah actually continues, and, and we read a little bit of, of a manual that he took 12 stones of Israel. I think you guys did a great job. Can you, give, can you give these guys a hand? But when you're far away, you can't see the details of what's going on. You probably don't even know that the altar is broken. Remember the title? Proximity to the altar matters. If you are not close to the altar, you probably don't know how to fix it. Let me break this down. Elijah is over here. He's telling the people to come closer. Come over here, guys. Come over here. And he picks up the stones and repairs the altar. I really think this was the intention of Elijah. He wanted the people to see how to repair the altar. He wanted them to come close and take note that you put one, two, three, four boxes in the bottom, just like Christian and Jacob did. Then you have a layer of three, two, and you, you put this up. And you have an altar. Because I believe if the people were so far away from God, they didn't have an altar in their backyard. They didn't have an altar on their front porch. They were so disconnected from God that they didn't know how this even looked like because it had been torn down. Proximity to the altar matters. If you're not close enough, you won't know how to fix this. Now, you have to understand, we don't really have altars like this in 2022. But we speak about the altar all the time. But you have to understand, at the times of Elijah, the altar was the point of connection between man and God. Something that you and I, thanks to the grace of Jesus and the sacrifice that he paid on the cross for us, we can walk down the street, somewhere Myrtle Avenue, and we can just say some words under our breath, and we are instantly at the altar because we position our hearts in the right place. So I kind of just need you to understand that when I'm talking about an altar then, I'm talking about an altar in our hearts where we position ourselves in anticipation that we're about to meet God. That we're about to meet his presence. I don't know. And maybe I can encourage you already thinking about the fact that the altar was in shambles. is something that we, in our walk with Christ, walk through so many times that our altar is in shambles. It's been torn down. We've encountered distractions. I love this church for this very reason that we always prioritize prayer. We always prioritize that this is intact. But it easily can happen that we get distracted, that gets destroyed, and all of a sudden, we lost proximity to the altar, and therefore, we are out of touch with God. R.T. Kendall is a, a, a former preacher at Westminster Chapel in, in England. And there's this quote that he put out. He said, Martin Luther spent two hours a day in prayer. John Wesley spent two hours a day in prayer. According to a recent poll taken on both sides of the Atlantic, the average church leader, pastor, priest, evangelist, teacher today spends four minutes a day in prayer. And you wonder why we're powerless. 
Elijah's intention was for people to understand that they needed to come close, take note how to repair an altar, and take that idea home and reestablish that in their own backyard, in their own family, in their own spaces, to have a place where they could connect with God. Proximity to the altar matters. There's something else that, that I want to illustrate with this. Okay, Elijah is up there. He says, come over here. He repairs the altar of the Lord. I actually think this was a setup. Why do I think it was a setup? Because Elijah knew exactly what was going to happen. He called the people to come close. As a matter of fact, I believe this is probably the first forced altar call that we know about in Scripture. Why? Imagine this is Elijah. He's finally finished fixing the altar. The Baal priests are still standing over there. The people have come closer, took note of how Elijah fixed the altar. But then the following thing happens. Elijah bows down. Puts the sacrifice on there. He even put water on it. He put water on it again. And he just basically made it impossible for the sacrifice to catch on fire. He prays. God answers. And he soaks up the sacrifice. The fire eats up the sacrifice. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been camping. But one of my favorite things about camping is campfire night. Keeps the mosquitoes away. <laughs> but there is a difference. Between a campfire, and we pretend the campfire is taking place on the altar, when you stand over here, or same campfire, nothing has changed, or you stand over here. You guys know the difference, right? You don't only see the fire, but you also feel the fire. Proximity to the altar matters. If you're not close to the altar, you won't feel the fire. I pretty much have been a Christian all my life. But there has been a lot of moments in my walk with Christ where I depended and lived my relationship with God through somebody else. Because I saw what God was doing in their life. And all I did was imitate because I saw. But there was nothing happening in my life because my altar was broken, in shambles, torn down, not repaired, and I missed out on the experience. Elijah uses the moment of the altar. He uses this moment of the altar, yes, to prove to all people who is God, but I really don't think that's what he wanted to prove. I don't think he wanted to prove who God is. I think he wanted to prove to the people who he intentionally called close that God is a God of experience, of relationship, of intimacy, of being close to. Not a God that you just look at from far distance and create your own little fairy tale world about. No, a God who wants to fall in your life. A God who wants to have presence in your life. I know this is Wednesday night prayer night. And I want to jump right back into prayer. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. And thank you so much for trusting me with the microphone. But there's nothing that substitutes the presence of God. There is nothing that beats us being close in the presence of God. And I don't know yet. We, we, the band is going to come up here again. I want to jump back into that moment of worship, back into that moment of doing exactly what the Israelites did. That when Elijah stepped up to the plate and he knew that the fire of God was about to fall in the place that he was standing, that he asked them to come as close as possible. When we advertise or, or announce Wednesday night prayer and we say at 6.30, the altar is open. There is nothing sacred about this stage. This is wood, vinyl, PVC, some glue, some paint. There is nothing 
special about this particular space. It is a posture of our heart that we're taking when we come up here at 630. We separate ourselves from the craziness that we may have experienced outside those doors at work or in school or at home before we walked in. And we say, we are intentionally getting close to the altar because God is about to meet with us and we want to be as close to his presence as possible.